I'm Anna Saxenian, and Dean of the School of Information, um, and I'm really pleased to introduce Morgan Ames. Uh, Morgan is currently a lecturer and postdoc here at the iSchool, and she's also the Interim Associate Director of Research at the Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society. She studies the ways in which computers and computing worlds seek to shape the identities of learners in and out of classrooms locally and abroad with a focus often uh, on those often left out of this identity work. Her book, which I believe she'll be speaking to us about today, is called The Charisma Machine, The Life, Death, and Legacy of One Laptop Per Child. Um, it should be published this year by MIT Press. Um, Morgan is also as associated with uh, the CTSP, Center for Technology, Society, and Policy, Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity Working Group, and the Berkman Institute of Data Science. She previously spent two years as a postdoc uh, at the Intel Science and Technology Center for Social Computing at UC Irvine, uh, where she worked with Paul Dorsch in the Department of Informatics. Morgan's PhD is in communication with a minor in anthropology from Stanford, where her dissertation won the Nathan Maccabee Outstanding Dissertation Award. She also has a BA in computer science and a MS in information science, <laughs> both from the University of California at Berkeley. And she has worked as a researcher at Google, Yahoo, Nokia, and Intel. With that, I'm gonna turn this over to Morgan. Thank you so much, Anna. And I'll be talking about um, mostly about my upcoming book, um, which is about this machine right here. You are welcome to come up and play with it a bit if you want. It has a fairly recent software update even, um, so you can take a look. Um, this is a, a kind of overview of, um, of this project, which has taken up the last 10 years or so of my research, but I'm also going to frame it in context of my next project, which I'm a couple years into and still kind of piecing together. Um, and um, one of the questions that I'm really trying to unpack across both of these projects, my current one and this one I'll be talking about, is how can we better foster inclusivity across the tech world? Um, this is a big question, one that goes back many decades. Um, white and Asian men tend to be overrepresented in the US technology industry, and this kind of varies, the numbers vary across different kinds of, of um, jobs within the tech industry. But, um, but this overrepresentation has been pretty consistent for a few decades now. Um, and there have been decades of research on this. There have been um, you know, really important findings in this space. Um, stereotype threat fits into this to some extent. Certainly unconscious bias, there's been a lot of focus on that. And of course, there's also um, conscious bias, um, various sexist or racist attitudes that come up in behave individual behaviors and also kind of larger institutional policies. Um, yes? Yeah, um, so I'd, I'd have to actually double check. I believe this is college majors. Um, but um, you know, there, there are a lot of pieces to this puzzle, yet um, computer science and the tech industry in particular has continued to languish despite a lot of the, the kind of work to diversify this. So one question I ask is, in addition to all of these, these problems, might there be a kind of ideological factor to this? Might there be a, a kind of set of assumptions about who belongs and who doesn't that influences the field and, infl and shapes the field? Um, so, so I study this sort of collection of questions within the context of one laptop per child. Um, in this project, I have kind of two branches, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each of them in the course of this talk. One is historical. So what are the cultural roots of one laptop per child? Where did it come from? Why did it resonate so well? Um, you know, it, it's at this point a project that's maybe 14 years, it's been about 14 years since its initial announcement, so it's a little bit of an old project, but if you recall, if you were around in the mid-2000s and kind of paying attention to the tech world, this project was really everywhere for a while. For a couple of years there, it was really the talk of Silicon Valley and the talk of, of kind of a lot of these broader discourses more generally. <coughs> Um, I also have a piece that is very grounded in what did kids actually do with this machine. This took me to Paraguay for six months in, in 2010 and another month in 2013 to see what kids actually made of this laptop. 
Paraguay was um, a strategic choice that I'll get into a little bit later and I'll talk about why. Um, and of course, some of the broader questions I hope to answer with this, um, what can one laptop or child tell us about how education and development projects more generally are framed and, and what makes for a successful project there? What the role of kind of utopian thinking in design and technology design more generally plays? And then how, does, um, how do ideologies shape the tech world in, in various important ways? So to start, I just want to, um, to refresh your memory or to introduce you to the project, um, play a commercial. This was posted a little bit before a, a project that OLPC had in 2007 called Give One, Get One. You could buy one of these laptops for, um, they were around $200 at the time, but you would pay $400. One would go to you and one would go to, um, at that point, an unspecified project. Most of them ended up in Haiti. So, um, so this was a give one, get one pitch, although they don't refer specifically to give one, get one here. And that's the only reference to the fact that this was the Give One, Get One program, that Amazon link there. Um, so I'll, I'll unpack a lot of these, uh, these statements. There are certainly a lot of provocative statements within that commercial. Um, but more broadly, I want to just kind of frame this in terms of of the idealism that was really rife with projects like this at the time. And one thing that, let's see if I can get it to work, there we go. Um, one quote that in my mind kind of sums this up and in, in a somewhat extreme way perhaps was said by the founder of the project. So he said, I don't want to place too much on OLPC, but if I really had to look at how to eliminate poverty, create peace and work on the environment, I can't think of a better way to do it. So with our 2019 eyes, right? It's easy to look at this and say like, what is he smoking, right? What, what, what kind of craziness is this? And there were a lot of people, even within One Laptop or Child, that would see Nicholas Negroponte's statements like this and kind of roll their eyes. But the reason they joined the project was some form of this, right? It was maybe not quite everything here, but they were really inspired to join this project because for them it was a mission, not a market. This was really important for them. Um, so, um, so we'll kind of loop back to this kind of idealism and inspiration in a little bit, but I do just want to kind of remind you of that. <coughs> so sorry. So what do I mean when I say um, one laptop or child's EXO laptop was a charismatic technology? This is a kind of unusual use of charisma, certainly usually charisma is attached to people, um, not to things, um, but there's a reason I'm doing this here. Um, charisma in this sense, promises some kind of action in the world. It's not just the device itself, as cute as it is, that is kind of the, the fetish object. Um, this device is meant to do something in the world. It's meant to enact some kind of social change. It's charismatic in that way. Um, this charisma gave those on the project a sense of purpose, direction, and conviction. It really brought people together in a really important way, and it brought projects all around the world together around this laptop. Um, and and you know, the function of that is, is really important. 
um, it made progress seem, in some cases, inevitable. Or if not inevitable, then, then fairly easy. We need to get these out there. We need to get these into the hands of kids, and change will follow. That was the story. In fact, Nicholas Negroponte would often talk about giving out laptops and walking away, literally walking away with no further support. And again, he tended to be a little bit more extreme in the way he portrayed these things. But versions of this were, were believed by a lot of the folks involved in this project. You know, if we got these out there in the world, change would follow. Um, that also forecloses various alternatives. You know, there was a lot of discussion about, well, why should we invest in this and not increasing teacher pay or making sure there are functional bathrooms in the schools or paying for textbooks. And, and there was a lot of discussion. Um, you know, a lot of the people within One Laptop or Child will push back and say, no, this is the way forward. Those are treading water. Those are incremental changes. This is the revolutionary change that we're looking for. Um, I am going to make an argument going forward that there are threads of this that are actually ideologically kind of conservative. And I don't mean conservative with a capital C here in terms of, of kind of US national politics, but I mean um, evoking kind of status quo kinds of identities and, and images that um, prop up a certain kind of person and, um, and don't support a lot of change and diversity within the field. And I'll dig more into that. So again, within the scope of all that's happened in the last year, this is an image from AI Now um, of some of the kind of major events that have happened throughout 2018, right? We have Cambridge Analytica. We have Tesla's autopilot fatal car crash. We have Mark Zuckerberg testimony in front of the Senate. Um, there has been a lot that's happened in the last year, in particular in the technology industry, that in some ways has shifted the narrative away from the optimism that it had before. So I'm very, one thing that I'm very curious about going forward in my research is what does this shift mean for the future of the industry, right? So, um, so how this fits into this broader narrative is a big question in my own mind, but I want you to kind of think back again to that, that 2005 idealism if you were in the technology industry at the time or if you've kind of seen older things. This is a throwback to some of the kind of 1990s cyber culture utopianism that you know we'd have this electronic community that was not going to be governed by all of the national borders and other kind of petty um, you know, petty concerns of, of uh, nations and other things. This was going to be this very utopian space. <coughs> so again, as a recap, um, OLPC's core principles, we, were, we uh, were introduced to them in that commercial. Children themselves should own the laptops, not parents, not schools, not governments, children. And this was to enable them to use the laptop anytime, anywhere, and to modify the laptop if they wanted. Um, another was that they were aiming at kind of elementary school age kids. This was not something for high school kids. There's been a lot of work on, on laptops for high school kids, um, but this was really for much younger kids. This was trying to get them at the point where they could really fall in love with the computer and especially with programming, and they could teach themselves if they wanted to. They want to give them to all kids. They want to um, have them internet connected. And finally, they wanted only free and open source software on these machines. And we'll get back to why this is particularly important um, a little bit later, but certainly the buy-in from the open source community was very big for this project. Um, a few of OLPC's key leaders, Nicholas Negroponte was in many cases the public face of the project. He was the one touring around the world, talking the project up. Um, he gave a couple talks at Davos. He has a few TED Talks on, on OLPC. Um, so in many ways, he's the public face of the project. However, I'm going to focus in going forward a little bit more on Seymour Papert, who in a lot of ways was the intellectual um, parent of the project. He, he had been promoting the idea of one, one computer per child for some 40 years before one laptop per child was announced. And many of the kind of design choices they made were based on his ideas. Um, a couple other key players, uh, Walter Bender, Mary Lou Jepsen, these were all faculty members at the MIT Media Lab. So the Media Lab had a very strong influence on the project um, with a lot of volunteers from all over the world as well contributing. So again, focus in on Nicholas Negroponte and Seymour Papert going forward. And in particular, Seymour Papert's um, educational theory constructionism was a really um, foundational cornerstone of the project. In fact, Nicholas Negroponte often in his talks would, would 
would uh, cite Seymour Papert as the main influencer here. Um, in a movie called Web that talked about one laptop per child in Peru, Nicholas Negroponte said the initial ideas for one laptop per child came in the late 1960s and early 1970s when a man named Seymour Papert made a very simple observation. And that was what children learned, that children learn different riffing on Apple there, maybe, um, when they write computer programs, because the act of writing a computer program is the closest you can come to thinking about thinking. So this is kind of, you know, Papert filtered through Negroponte, clearly, but you, you start to see some of the, the idealism around the power of learning to program and the, the allure of learning to program. Um, and this was, in fact, a key piece of constructionism. So constructionism, as described in various publications that Seymour Papert has put out over the years, um, in many ways resembles constructivism. And in fact, Papert studied with Jean Piaget for five years in Geneva before coming to the MIT Media Lab. Um, it, however, diverges in several important respects, in particular, taking on various threads from um, Papert's time with the Media Lab. So when he joined the Media Lab, he joined Marvin Minsky. Here's Mar Papert and Marvin Minsky in a picture together. He joined Marvin Minsky's um, AI group. And um, sorry, this wasn't the Media Lab at the time. This was just MIT Media Lab. Came a little bit later, but he joined um, this AI group and um, started spending a lot of time with the kind of hacker group that would take over this lab, Minsky's lab, at night. Um, Papert brought, kind of framed constructionism around some of the activities of this group and brought it to a mass audience in his best-selling 1980 book, Mindstorms. Um, and in that book also outlined how constructionism could be applied through the logo programming language, which was very popular in the mid-1980s amid an early push to teach programming to kids, something we certainly hear echoed today. Um, OLPC wasn't this first constructionist experiment. Um, it began again with Logo. We have it here. This was a project that was rolled out um, across the technology world in the early 1980s, and in fact, across the US in the, in the 1980s. So I used it in my own elementary school, and I think I've had conversations with a couple of you about using it in your elementary schools as well. Um, Logo was incredibly popular across these worlds in the 1980s. And this was at a really key time when the computing industry was transforming from being a fairly niche career to being um, one of immense power and importance um, with huge demands for employees. It was, Logo was championed as a more playful, intuitive alternative to basic, um, but those most passionate, uh, but for those most passionate about constructionism, Logo represented so much more. So, um, Constructionism has also been built into a number of other programs over the years. Um, you might be familiar with the Scratch programming environment. That's also inspired by constructionism. And in fact, um, ascended alongside One Laptop or Child in the late 2000s, but has, has continued to be incredibly popular. Um, Papert con uh, contributed to the Mindstorms, Lego Mindstorms kit, named after his first book. There's Makey Makey and Fidgets out of Media Lab, the Fab Lab uh, Makerspace environment um, and various turtle-inspired learn-to-code movements, um, a whole bunch of them including a board game, Robot Turtle, where you order an adult around to act like a turtle. Um, so constructionism continues to have a really big influence across the kind of learn-to-program world. Why constructionism still resonates like this takes us back to 1964 when Papert joined MIT to conduct artificial intelligence research with um, Marvin Minsky and first encountered MIT's nascent hacker culture at the time. So this is a picture from 1962, a little bit before, um, of three people working around um, uh, PDP-3 playing Space War. And Papert's first encounter with this hacker group would set the course for the rest of his life's work, as he describes it. Papert explains that one of the main reasons he decided to join Minsky at MIT was what he called this, what he called this group's wonderful sense of playfulness that I had, I, he had experienced there on brief visits. This came together, he says in Mindstorms, um, in all night sessions around a PDP-1 computer that had been given to Minsky, it was pure play. Um, oops. And yes, and then in a later book, he said, at MIT, I had my first experience of the excitement and the holding power that keeps people working all night on their computers. I realized that children might be able to enjoy the same advantages, a thought that changed my life. 
She talks a lot about these early experiences. So I'm going to, to draw some parallels between um, the kind of ethos of this hacker group and constructionism to show how this influenced him. Um, one is that they really, this group really valued having complete freedom to explore computers um, and the source code of the program. So, you know, the source code of Space War was, was circulated and iterated on by this group. Um, however, unlike this proudly oddball group of hackers, he idolized MIT, Papert claimed that computers could have universal appeal. Um, he said in Mindstorms, the computer is, is the Proteus of machines, its essence is its universality, its power to simulate, because it can take on a thousand forms and can serve a thousand functions, it can appeal to a thousand tastes. Um, so this was a really remarkable statement. So at the time, there was still a fairly widespread sense, in 1980, that, um, that computers were going to enable, you know, militarized conformist societies. This was still a, a thread that was fairly prevalent at the time. So in the midst of this, um, this has uh, the idea that computers can be liberatory, can be something that's appealing to everyone, was, was still pretty revolutionary, but something that really caught on within the world more broadly as we see today. Um, And so the next thing I want to unpack a little bit is what Papert called yearners. So in his books, he talked about how children are naturally born yearners, naturally born creative, and school will sometimes kind of push that natural creativity out of them. Um, <coughs> and this thread is something that definitely resonates across um, not just constructionism projects, but across our culture more broadly, right? The naturally creative child is something that seems like a familiar kind of trope to all of us. Um, however, the, uh, this broader cultural discourse of the natural curiosity, brilliance, and brilliance of children, um, that they're kind of above culture, they're, they're somehow more noble than, than adults who are mired in their petty, um, petty concerns, um, is something that is very historically, geographically, and socioeconomically situated. This is something that um, is also gendered, as this image, this 1898 painting sort of depicts. So, um, so here we have, you know, the boys roughhousing, and over in the corner, a girl with a very clean petticoat reading a book, right? Um, so this imaginary of childhood traces its roots through Enlightenment culture to an extent, but really started to find some grounding in mid-1800s um, reform efforts to make school, to expand um, primary schooling, to make it something mandatory, and to um, enforce legislation to get kids out of factories. So there was a kind of shift in the idea of what childhood was around this time, in part because of these reform efforts, in the 1850s through the end of the 1800s. Um, and this framed childhood and especially boyhood as a developmental stage that's really distinct from adulthood, more noble, more creative, and closer to nature. Um, threads of this individual and individualism and creativity were then taken up more widely and accentuated in American ideologies of childhood within the next century. And I'm going to focus in, in particular, on some ideas that Amy Ogata explores in a book that, um, called the Designing the, the Creative Child. Um, in post 19 in po sorry, post-World War II America, 1950s America, this idea of childhood was kind of taken up and a ton of toys were marketed around it. Um, children started having individual playrooms where they would keep all their toys and, and this kind of individualized creativity really became institutionalized within American culture more broadly. So the third thread um, that I want to outline here is the role of rebellion, and in particular, rebellion against a particular idea of school. So um, as part of this individualism, individualism and creativity of childhood, a certain degree of healthy rebellion has also become an accepted part of American youth culture, especially for boys. So this is the kind of rebellion that is sanct often sanctioned as boys will be boys, or even encouraged as free-thinking individualism. We might think back to maybe Tom Sawyer or Huck Finn as sort of archetypes of this kind of rebellion. Um, and this has, this has been linked to creative confidence um, driven by naturally oppositional masculine sensibility. So, so this is another thread of this kind of larger imaginary of childhood. 
Um, similarly, one laptop per child in some of the constructionist projects before it framed rebellion um, against authority as a natural good, as did the hacker culture more broadly. Um, so in a televised speech in the mid-1980s, for example, Seymour Papert said, nothing is more ridiculous than the idea that this technology, computers, can be used to improve school. It's going to display school at the way we have understood school. What's wrong with school is absolutely fundamental. So, um, so I think this, this quote in particular points to how rebellion was taken up within the tech world in the 1980s. So um, sort of in my mind, one of the prototypes for this is the movie War Games. 1983 movie, um, this was the 25th anniversary poster of it, so this was not the original poster. But, um, but it and a number of other media portrayals in the 1980s started showing computer programming as a site for rebellion. This was, this was a major shift also from computer programming be, being a tool for the military, you know, a tool for kind of the military industrial complex. But again, it kind of gets caught up in this lar these larger discourses of rebellion. And this rebellion is often pushing back against this particular notion of school and the idea of school as being kind of like a factory. You know, there are various problems with framing school as a factory, but this is, again, a kind of rhetorical trope that we see echoed in, in media portrayals and in kind of popular discourse about what school is. Even though school has shifted a lot in how it is practiced, what kind of pedagogical tools are used, there's still this image of school kind of stamping out factory students or using factory methods. So again, just returning back to this idea of OLPC's XO laptop as a charismatic technology, I just want to kind of think again about how these threads of what, chi what childhood is, what rebellion is, or uh, what the role of rebellion is in childhood, and what how we are rebelling against school is in some ways ideologically conservative, right? It's drawing on some very kind of common and long-standing tropes about who this machine is meant to appeal to. So again, we have computers, charisma of, of boyhood especially, and a charisma of rebellion against school. So how did this get built in to this laptop? Um, there are a few features that were specifically built around playfulness, for example. The, the, original, um, the original prototype had a hand crank that was never on a, a working prototype, but it was replaced by these kind of friendly looking ears, right? It's a little bit of an anthropomorphic laptop. Also in that um, in that commercial that that had it kind of bop down and wiggle its ears to everybody, um, you know it's often press pictures would have smiling children on it. Even the logo was was meant to be like a child with arms flung wild in in ecstasy of play. So there was a lot about this that was very playful. It was also shipped with a number of um, video games and video game engines, um, video video game environments for making video games that, was, that framed play in a very particular way, right? Technical play was meant to be something that, um, that involved maybe gaming, involved maybe competition, and has this kind of long history in this hacker culture back to space war, back to that, that um, early computer game that the MIT hacker group developed in the 1960s. Um, there was, as I mentioned, all of the software on this was free and open source software, which was very important to the community more broadly. Um, there was notably no teacher interface for this. There was no other interface for teachers or any pedagogical tools. There was not even a way to kind of broadcast one screen to everybody else, so teachers couldn't really share a screen or share assignments. They were kind of reduced to a co-learner through this interface. Um, and there was also a mesh networking system that was meant to allow students to kind of connect to one another's machines and collaborate. Um, and this was highly vaunted at the time. It actually didn't really work well because it turns out that this machine was, was a pretty slow machine in a lot of ways. But, um, but this was often talked about online as a really kind of innovative feature. Um, so, these features embodied a lot of these imaginaries of childhood, of play, of rebellion. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, while the project has faded from view, these objects have entered the permanent collection of several museums. So, I, so you know, this laptop itself continues to be a kind of important symbol for a lot of this. So I argue that a number of these features are, um, are what I call nostalgic design. 
Um, and there are a number of reasons that I call it this. So one thing, um, originally this laptop was meant to cost $100. And in order to get that cost low, they made it a fairly underpowered machine. It has a one gigabyte, one gigabyte solid state hard drive. In 2005, 50 to 100 gigabytes was pretty typical. Um, it was about equivalent to maybe a 386, maybe a little faster than a 386 computer, which was pretty typical of the late 90s. Um, um, it did not ship with a video player. It did not ship with a, um, a music player. It shipped with some music creation software that could play music, but, it was, but the software was much more meant to, to kind of create new music. Um, it was not designed like machines were in the mid-2000s. And one reason for this was because the way that people talked about what kids should be doing with these machines continuously reference back to what they did with machines or what they remember doing with, mach with machines when they were kids. So often they'd say, well, on my you know, Commodore system when in the early 80s, I didn't have this and I found it so powerful because I wasn't distracted by the, the, all these other things. We don't need this machine to be really powerful. And so its underpoweredness in a way became a feature. It became a sort of nostalgic feature that, threw, that was a throwback to some of these machines that people used before. Um, I do want to kind of point out though that some of the ways that they talked about this were not really true to what actually happened. Um, and that's why I bring in nostalgia in particular. And um, there's a great book on, on nostalgia called The Way We Never Were, American Families and the Nostalgia Trap. Um, and this is not to denigrate nostalgia per se, because nostalgia can be a very important force for us, right? Um, Stephanie Kuntz talks about how nostalgia for a particular kind of nuclear family that you know, was always, was never completely widespread, right? It was, it was it's always been present, but there have always been a lot of alternate arrangements for families. But, but idealism for a particular kind of family have fueled policy debates and national discourse around families for, for decades now. Um, similarly, nostalgia for a particular kind of computer use, even though, even if it never really existed in quite that form, can fuel technology design. Um, there's a normativity to this nostalgic design. So on one hand, they design for the child that they remember themselves being, right? They design for the child that, that they remember teaching themselves to program. They remember um, you know, being falling in love with the computer and wanting to spend all of their time on it, being captivated by the intricacies of programming languages. Um, and they hope that this will resonate with kids around the world. But of course, if you look back, this didn't resonate with all the kids of their generation either, right? So, um, so there's a kind of a little bit of a normative aspect of this. Who exactly is this going to appeal to? Either they're going to have to kind of recruit more kids to the cause, or they're only going to, going to appeal to a few who are kind of made in their own image, right? So, that, so there's a, a, um, a little bit of an exclusionary angle creeping in already. I also briefly want to address one laptop or child's model for cultural change with this. So, um, so one thing I discussed is how this, this idea of childhood as being kind of closer to nature um, also places it outside of culture. And so some of the early critiques of the project of it being culturally imperialist, sometimes they push back and say, no, 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 this is for the kids. They aren't, they aren't yet inculcated into the, into the you know, the norms of particular culture, they're gonna make with this laptop what they will. They, they will find something else. And so they kind of fell back on some imaginaries of childhood in that way. Um, however, this also places the onus on children themselves to create cultural change. It's not going to be, you know, infrastructural investments, it's not going to be um, school shifting or new policies, it's going to be the children themselves. And of course, if change fails to happen, the blame is on the children too. So I'm going to shift now into how this was translated in Paraguay and what that meant for all of these promises that the project made. Um, a few you know, fairly basic questions I went, to, went down to answer, what do children do with these exos in their free time? Um, how are exos used in the classroom? And finally, what do these mean for OLPC, but also more generally for utopianism and for technology design? 
Um, so just to give you a sense and situate Paraguay within the larger landscape of OLPC sales, originally um, Negroponte and One Laptop or Chubb were generally talked about selling hundreds of millions of these machines. Um, in reality, they sold about 2.5 million, which is still a lot of machines, and over 85% of them were sold in Latin America. So um, you know, early on, they kind of targeted Africa in a kind of problematic way, heart of darkness kind of evoking way. Um, but it turns out that a lot of African nations didn't have the spare capital and didn't have really the political will to, to invest heavily in this machine. Or uh, I think the one project that was of any kind of notable size was in Rwanda. In contrast, um, many Latin American nations, which were generally more kind of middle income, um, already had strong commitments to open source and pretty strong open source cultures, were really interested in this machine. So Uruguay, um, down here, was the one country, the one re reasonably big country to actually go one to one. They bought enough laptops for every child in the entire country. Peru also has a lot of laptops. It's a much larger country, so they had maybe one, I think my estimate was one for every 10 or so kids. Um, so they weren't, they didn't go completely one to one across the country, but in a couple different rollouts, they, they got a fair number of them. Um, these two are the largest projects out there with a number of others kind of medium, that are medium sized projects that maybe targeted one state or one, one region within a country. I ended up focusing in on Paraguay because in 2009 and 2010, it was talked about as the most successful OLPC project. A lot of people were holding it up as a model to follow. Um, Uruguay and Paraguay were, were in close talks and Uruguay followed Paraguay's lead in a number of, of um, design decisions that they did. It's a smaller program, but, um, but it was a particularly interesting one. In Peru, for example, they largely followed Nicolas Negroponte's advice to hand out laptops and walk away. There was very little infrastructural investment. There was very little investment in teacher training. And um, in some of these schools in the high Andes, there was not even any electricity to charge the laptops. And while there were promises to roll out solar panels, these promises never came to fruition. And so not surprisingly, these laptops often ended up in cabinets in the back of the classroom, um, not being used. And there was no finding of, of any kind of educational benefit from these laptops. So, it's um, still an important story to tell, but I really wanted to dig into a story that was said to be successful. So I want to introduce you to the people who rolled out this project. Um, in Paraguay, this was not a government project. This, this project was rolled out by an NGO. Um, they did hope that the government would take it over. In fact, one of the founders down here in front, Raul, um, had originally pitched the project to his uh, friend's father, who happened to be running for the president, presidency of Paraguay in 2006, um, and, uh, but, was not, but that candidate ultimately did not win, so he was not able to kind of have an in through the government. Um, they were hoping, though, that this would be a proof of concept, right? Um, another thing that the, the story about the, the friend's dad, who was running for president of Paraguay, tells you, though, that these, these kids were part of the elite of Paraguay. And I say kids because they're in their 20s. Of course, when I was doing this field work, I was, I was also in my 20s. So, um, but they were generally very young. They're very idealistic. Most of them were um, par at least partially trained um, in the United States. Many of them had, have since held tech jobs in the United States. And so they had a, a connection to Silicon Valley and to the tech industry within the States. And the message that one laptop per, chi per child had really resonated with them. It was something that was immediately legible to them, and they were very, very excited about it. Um, within Paraguay more broadly, though, um, they had to do a lot of work to make this project work. So they did not follow Nicholas Negroponte's advice to just give out laptops and walk away. Um, they put in a lot of infrastructural investment. This top picture shows there was a kind of rebar tower going up. This is one of the schools that they rolled out in Paraguay. That rebar, rebar tower is um, a WiMAX tower. So that's bringing internet to the schools. Then they have routers throughout the school to distribute Wi-Fi within the school. Um, you can see the little XOs painted on the outside in kind of anticipation of the project. They also had to install plugs in all of the classrooms. The classrooms did not have or need plugs before this, this project rolled out. Um, less than 10% of the population had computers 
before this project was rolled out. Um, I did find when I returned in 2013, we had kind of re we have we had uh, tipped over a, a cusp of computer ownership even within the global south, and a lot more people had laptops in 2013. So this was a kind of threshold moment, and many more people probably would have started having laptops even without this project. But this sort of accelerated it at least within this area of Paraguay where they rolled out. So they rolled out within one state in Paraguay, the Cordillera State, um, the, count, the state capital was Caucupe. So I spent a lot of time in this small regional city. Um, it was outside of the capital, which was pretty important to them. They wanted to, to kind of have a proof of concept in a reasonably you know, big town, but not, not the capital itself. Um, in addition to all of this infrastructure, they had a lot of social events. They ended up hiring teacher trainers in every classroom to help the teacher, not every classroom, sorry, every school, to help the teachers incorporate these laptops into their, um, their curriculum. And they ended up having some, um, some success, right? The laptops started being used a little bit. However, this put a lot of onus on teachers in particular. So this is an image from um, a teacher training session that I attended in, um, in July 2010. This is a group of Paraguayan teachers. Um, so these teachers, Generally, they have a lot of requirements for their job. They, they are generally required to cover four subjects a day. Um, they have to do this in three and a half hours of instruction per day. That's all the instruction that Paraguayan kids got per day. Um, the school day was four hours long with a half hour of recess. Um, these teachers were generally mothers too. They had a lot of family demands. And within Paraguayan culture, family demands generally fall to, um, to mothers or to other women to manage. Um, they were paid approximately half of the Paraguayan minimum wage um, for their work which um, as public service employees, they were exempt from minimum wage laws, but it just kind of points to how undervalued education was within this. Um, teachers unions, while I was there in 2010, were staging um, strikes on alternate Thursdays, fighting for minimum wage. So come on in. Um, and, um, and they had some concessions later, but, but this continues to be kind of a, a point of contention. Um, the result of this was that not a lot of teachers were willing to put in a fairly significant amount of time and energy to learning this machine. They were required to do um, two weeks of unpaid training every year, two weeks of unpaid training, which, which uh, OLPC training that Paraguay Educa provided would count towards. Um, but you know, incorporating this into curriculum was a lot more work than just that. And a lot of teachers said, I just don't have the bandwidth for that. Um, there was also some really interesting conflicting visions of what development should be. So um, Paraguay had been up until 1989 in a decades long dictatorship, like much of Latin America throughout the 70s and 80s. Um, and there was still kind of echoes of this. The same political party had been in power up till 2008. This changed briefly up from 2008 to 2012, but then the, um, the president of the opposition party was impeached under suspicious circumstances, and now the, the same party of the dictator is back in power. Um, <coughs> There was also a lot of aid of various sorts um, flowing into Paraguay. There was a lot of Peace Corps workers. There were a lot of other development projects within Paraguay. It is a fairly for, poor country. And so within this context, you know, this laptop project comes in um, and, and in some ways competes with different kinds of narratives around what development should mean. Um, interestingly enough, though, it, it inspired hope and um, and uh, kind of inspiration for pedagogy shifts in a way that other projects did not. And I think this speaks to some of the ways that the charisma of the project did translate. Um, however, how that kind of filtered down into classroom use, I'm going to go into next. So um, Paraguayan classroom, as I mentioned, with they have three and a half hours of instruction. Very few textbooks were in use across Paraguay. Textbooks were expensive. Often the schools would have one set that was used as kind of reference for teachers. But the standard tools of um, Paraguayan instruction was a chalkboard and, um, and chalk. And then kids would have notebooks. They could you know, finish their, their uh, um, tasks in. And then teachers would grade the notebooks. 
Um, within this context, these laptops in the first year and a half even experienced a lot of breakdown. So as kids were taking these around, they would use them in ways and sometimes they would drop. Nicholas Negger Ponte in his early presentations would often fling these closed across, I don't want to do it in case it breaks mine, but um, they would, he would fling these across stages and then pick them up and turn them on to show that they still worked. And this created expectations that these were indestructible. However, while they were ruggedized, they were not indestructible and they did break. And so teachers had to deal with the fact that up to a quarter or sometimes more of their students did not have working laptops. Um, a number of others might have uninstalled the software that the teacher wanted to use that day. And so they had to deal with re-downloading and reinstalling all of that software over what was often a fairly slow internet connection. Um, when I returned in 2013, the breakdown story had gotten much worse. There were huge stacks of um, unrepaired laptops in the main office of uh, Paraguay, Educa, and Cao Coupe. The few teachers who were still um, trying to pursue the project um, had these you know, very carefully worded, um, how to take care of your laptop, how to be very careful with your laptop. So this, there was this shift from you know, this laptop being this indestructible object to being one that was very fragile. And this affected classroom use. So um, a few teachers still did try to work on using classrooms. In this classroom, um, kids were asked to borrow laptops from family members to bring to school once a week so they could have a lesson. Um, in order to deal with discharged batteries. This is a private school. Um, they strung, you can see a kind of daisy, somewhat dicey daisy chain of, uh, of extension cords across the classroom. And, um, and, they were, and this teacher was able to um, at least temporarily kind of use the laptop. However, a lot of schools didn't even have, you know, the, the uh, power cords to daisy chain. Um, you can see here some of the students have their own mice. That was something that was out of reach of a lot of poorer students. Um, and for a lot of teachers, it was just too frustrating to use in the classroom. That said, the internet in particular was incredibly charismatic, not just to students, but to teachers. Um, one teacher said, um, we had a meeting with phase one teachers. These were the teachers who um, got laptops in the first phase of, of Paraguay Educa's rollout, and everyone had their XOs, and were checking their email, everyone looking at their screen and not paying attention. Then we turned off the internet, and the whole room closed their XOs and began to pay attention. So this is something I think that's probably familiar to many of us in the room too, um, not just with students, but potentially with colleagues as well. <coughs> um, so I want to shift now to what did kids do with these machines in their free time? Um, one early framing of the project that was encouraged by the design of it was that these objects were little toys. Um, however, this was not necessarily a good thing. They were seen as little toys, therefore kind of throwaway. And um, because there wasn't a lot of early training around um, how to use these in the classroom, um, a lot of that early framing kind of stuck with kids. So, so they said, well, I'm just not very interested. It's just a little toy. Um, some of them also had kind of little problems that didn't make the machine completely inoperable, but made it very hard to use. So um, you can see here, there's some tape over some of the keys. The membrane on the first generation keyboard was just a little bit too thin, and so if you used it a bunch, the keys fell off. Um, the, you can see a few pixels out on the screen up there. The screen isn't totally blank, but it just makes it a little bit harder to use. The trackpad was really unreliable and really hard to use as well. So a lot of kids you know, encountered this and said, this is just too much of a pain to use. I'd rather go play soccer. I have to go take care of my little siblings. I have to help my family with a family business. I'm just not interested. And this, in fact, made up about half of kids. They were just not interested. Another 15% had uh, broken laptops in when I did kind of my survey of, of the state of repair of laptops in um, August 2010, about a year and a half in, or a year and a quarter into the program. Another, um, the, another one third of kids saw these machines and said, oh cool, I know what computers are good for. They're good for consuming media. So they would get on the internet, they download songs, they download videos, they download video games. And in some cases, they, they had to go through some fairly complex convolutions to be able to play these videos and video games. Some of them installed alternate desktops um, in order to 
to be able to play video, for example, because this didn't ship with a video player. Um, you know, this was a one gigabyte hard drive, and so a lot of them uninstalled, a lot of the pre-installed pre software to make more room for downloads. Um, they, <laughs> yeah. um, and in many ways, this was very, you know, tracking how a media file would kind of pr propagate through schools was something that I found really fascinating during my field work. You know, it often came in through the, the oldest kids in the program, the sixth and seventh graders, and then filtered down through siblings and, and classmates to the younger kids. And in a lot of ways, it was really ingenious. And you know, these were really creative uses. My one worry, though, is that those who were setting the stage for what this meant were not, was not one laptop or child or parents or teachers, but media corporations. You know, the people making these video games, the people who, um, in some cases, sponsored them. So when I was there, for example, one very popular game was called Vasculet. It is a Nestle game. It is made by Nestle. It has a Nestle character that runs along and, and much like Popeye, will drink chocolate milk in order to kind of power up. It was a little side-scrolling game. And, um, you know, this is very popular. It's also a gigantic advertisement. And so, you know, the fact that various media, various corporations, not just media corporations, but a lot of different corporations could kind of make content specifically for this machine in a way that was kind of framed as educational, I found a little bit problematic with this project. Um, there were also some old games that were ported over. This is, uh, this is Doom, a fairly popular kind of early, mid-90s game. That, um, that in many ways kind of broke new ground in computer graphics, and so this was why this was ported. It's also a fairly violent game, and so this one was you know, met with a lot of consternation among um, parents and teachers within Paraguay. So I, I also just briefly want to talk about whether there were any kids, any at all, who are taking up the more programming side of the machine, right? So this, these machines shipped with Scratch, they shipped with Turtle Art, a kind of block-based version of Logo. Um, they shipped with a number of other environments, eToys, um, Pippi, which is a Python um, learning environment. And, um, and certainly the goals of One Laptop or Child were to encourage programming, to encourage kids to learn to program and to love programming. Um, I did find that there were a few kids involved in this. And, um, and I, you know, instead of just kind of stopping there, I interviewed them and spent a fair amount of time with them and found some really interesting patterns. So one was that their caretakers often encouraged this creativity. Um, one of them said, you know, don't use it like a TV. Use it like something more interesting. Um, these were often, but not always, wealthier households. And in particular, they often, though not always, had a, already had another computer at home. So the parents may not know this laptop in particular, but they kind of knew what computers were good for. And they would kind of steer their kids towards particular computer uses. Some of them worked in the tech industry, in fact, in Paraguayan tech industry. Um, these were definitely not predictive, so I don't want to make any kind of causal statements here. There were certainly kids who were you know, from wealthier households with a computer at home who, who um, were really interested in this as a media machine. But I think it does point to the fact that this larger soci social ecology is incredibly incredibly important for shaping kids' interests. That said, um, these kids were generally also interested in these as media machines. So it wasn't just learning or just media. It was often kind of both. So in the process of translating this charisma, this points to something um, that was missing from the original story of this, the, the influence of these children's social worlds on their motivations and activities with this laptop. So often the story was framed as an individual and a computer and nothing else about the world around it. Or if there was anything else, it was kind of an oppositional, um, oppositional story that was, framed, that was um, put forth. What I found in Paraguay was that these kids influen were influenced by their social worlds and kind of co-constructed meanings about what these machines were and what, what kinds of effects they might have on their, world, on their worlds. So I want to take a step back for a moment and look at the overall arc of the project in Paraguay Educa and point to what I call Charisma's Catch-22. So Paraguay Educa um, first handed out laptops in 2009. I went in 2010, about a year and a half, year and a quarter to a year and three quarters into the program to see what kids were doing with these machines. I then went back again in 2013 for a month 
to, um, to do some additional follow-up work. What I found in 2013 was that the funding that they, were, they had enjoyed in 2010 had almost entirely been cut off. They were down to a skeleton crew. They were running some Saturday programs, but that was about all of the capacity that they had. And the story that they said was that, well, we, you know, we tried to make the promises of charisma come true, but we naturally fell short because those promises were so sky high. We were kind of set up for failure. Um, and I feel like this is a catch-22 that comes up in a lot of charismatic projects, right? In order to even get attention, one laptop per child is no exception. In order to even get attention, they have to promise big. They have to promise transformational change. And then when they inevitably fall short, they either have to pretend that they achieved change in some way, or they have to admit that they did not achieve transformational change and maybe say, but we have these nice incremental benefits. Either way, though, the project is seen as complete within a few years, and it's very hard to get long-term funding for these projects. Um, so, so I want to kind of also talk about what we can learn from this Charisma machine. So there's, there's some value in Charisma, right? Um, Charisma provided conviction and purpose to the people involved in this project. Um, it smoothed the way feelings of uncertainty about whether it would work. It made progress seem inevitable. It rallies resources for huge projects. And in this way, it taps into um, kind of broader ideal, ideas that others have discussed, such as the technological sublime or the digital sublime. This is the, I, an idea that historians of technology have discussed as um, the feeling of kind of awe that we ha might have with new technologies. You know, the locomotive in the 1840s, the um, the internet in the early 1990s, the radio in the 1920s, all of these were really sublime technologies that rallied massive amounts of resources around them. Um, at the same time, there's a downside to these kinds of projects. Um, there's this catch-22 of project funding. You have to promise big, favors the short term. Um, there's also some pitfalls in the nostalgic design that we saw through this project. It's designed for a mythologized past rather than a, the messiness of the present. Um, and it may paradoxically reinforce certain elements of the status quo, certain ideas we have about, say, boyhood and the role that technology might play in it or the role of rebellion in computing cultures um, that might not translate elsewhere. So this isn't just one laptop or child, right? My, my next project kind of expands some of these ideas out into computing cultures more generally. We did see some recurrent social imaginaries that I think have larger um, power within computing cultures more generally. Childhood, um, we saw in kind of Paffert's yearners, um, some of the nostalgia threads, um, schools as, as unchanging, that factory model of schooling. Um, computer use as transformatory, as something that can be transformatory for everybody. And there's a thread of technological determinism across all of this, that there's kind of a lack, there's an erasing of the agency of individual users to decide what to do with these. Um, one thing I've hoped to do in this project is to bring that agency, in particular the agency of the children, really back front and center into my narrative. Um, there are some other similarly charismatic projects that draw on these, some of these same kinds of imaginaries. At the MIT Media Lab, um, Logo, obviously, OLPC, Scratch, Fab Labs, a number of other projects within that lab. Um, and MIT Media Lab has in many ways centered the work of Seymour Papert across a number of their, um, of their classes and projects. Um, parts of the maker movement have similar kinds of ideas about childhood and the kind of technical play that, that children are innately interested in. Um, certainly some of the alt school movements um, have similar kinds of ideas. And Silicon Valley more broadly, and this is again one thing I'm exploring a bit more in my next project, but um, the idea of childhood within the Valley more broadly and the kind of the, the idealization of a particular kind of youth really shapes what kinds of projects are seen as exciting. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to shift into questions, and I really thank you all for your time here. Thank you very much. I'll start with a question. Yes, thank um, you. Really interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, 
I'm just curious, you, you sort of talked about Paraguay as touted as the success, and then you did repeat it, and you said it had some success, and then you went on to talk about yeah. <laughs> problems with teachers and you know a lot of problems. What is the metric for success, and what does it actually mean? If I mean, what, what were you getting at? Or yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, the, so you know, the early metrics of success that I was referring to was was very much OLPC defined. They were seeing the pro the laptops being used. They were seeing people talking about them in exciting way, excited ways, um, much from the Paraguay Echica people. There are a couple people who worked for Paraguay Echica who were incredibly technically talented and were actually contributing um, patches for the software and, and even new software upstream to the main build of, of the uh, OLPC software. And so kind of all of these together, they saw as a success story on their own terms, um, a very kind of programming they had predicted. focused. It wasn't the successes they had anticipated. So, so they didn't have a lot of stories early on about actual kids using the laptops, right? So these were the kinds of stories that, that were a lot harder to construct. Um, one thing, um, I think, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to just tell a quick story about how um, success sort of was performed in a way while I was there. So what, when I was doing my fieldwork in 2010, one of the founders of OLPC, Walter Bender, came to visit for a couple days. And I was very interested to see what he was going to make of actually seeing a classroom, because a classroom visit was on his agenda. And like the breakage and the uninstalled software and all of the issues that teachers ran into. Like what, because this was very far from the model of, um, of success that he had been talking about, certainly with the project that one laptop or child had been talking about. Um, as well. So he arrives that day, um, you know, the, the principal introduces him to all of the students assembled outside before school. This is a very important man. A few of you are going to interact with him. I think I have, I can bring up a few slides of it. Sorry, so here he is in front of the school. Um, everyone's applauding. Um, Walter actually doesn't speak Spanish, so he's not understanding that what's, what's being said here. Um, but a number of kids come forward. They're going to be in a class with Walter. Um, they're lined up here, and I notice they're in school uniforms from other schools. None of these kids are actually attending this school. Um, they had been brought in largely by the teacher trainers, Paraguay Educa's teacher's trainers, to be there that day. Um, they go into a classroom. Um, there's a ton of adults, and the ratio of students to adults is about two to one, and typical is like 20 to one, right? Um, Walter gives a one-hour lecture in English that's translated into Spanish by these two Paraguay Educa employees standing up there. And then he closes his laptop and leaves, and that's his classroom visit. He didn't even really look to see what kids were doing on the screen. I was sitting in the back of the room, as you can kind of tell from my photo here, and I saw that kids, you know, in some cases were sort of had their laptops open but untouched on their, their laptop, on their laps. Um, in other cases, they had opened up like web browsers and were, you know, kind of just <laughs> surfing. So, um, you know, he wrote about this in a later book as this indication of the success story. And I just thought, you know, he, nobody was interested in scratching the surface of this performance, including Walter. And so, you know, I, I felt like that was kind of very evocative to me of how these con success stories get constructed. In a way, so yes. Sorry, that was a little bit more of a long answer, but. Some of the kids that used it initially are now old enough to be working. Is there any increased tech sector activity anywhere following on this? Yeah, so that that's a great question, um, and I have been kind of following up with um, with Paraguay Educa. You know, there's there is still a skeleton crew there. Um, for a lot of these kids, they're, some of them had kind of technical interests already, and, then, and some of them are in college. I think they're not quite to the point where they're out in the working world yet, but, um, but they're kind of later college now. And, um, you know, whether how OLPC kind of factored in is a little bit complicated to untangle, but I feel like, you know, the, the narratives shaped by this project did influence their self-image in a few cases in, in important ways. Where they will go with that and what they would have done otherwise, of course, I think is a big question. But, but I think it did, you know, it was, it was a really big project and everyone talked about it. What that means more broadly, though, I think is um, a really much more complicated question. So, um, you know, there was, so one family in particular I followed up on, in fact, I have a, a 
chapter of the one chapter in the book that kind of focuses in on them in particular and the kinds of stories that they had about um, who they wanted to be growing up. They were very technical. Their mother was also a teacher in the program, and so she went through the training, and she was one of the few like really passionate teachers about this who did take the time to learn about these programs and tried to recruit a number of her colleagues into the program with pretty limited success, sadly. But, um, but her, her, her kids you know, were some of those kids learning scratch and doing kind of some interesting things with the machines. Um, there were some really problematic ways that gender played out there. So there were two, there was a brother and sister about a year apart um, who co-constructed a number of projects and the brother was framed by Paraguay Educa as this like, you know, genius gifted child and the sister, one of, one of the Paraguay Educa employees once said, she's a conventional thinker and I thought, they did all of their projects together and in a lot of ways, she had a lot more drive to do more interesting things. She was learning Japanese on the machine. Um, he was just very much focused on scratch. But, um, but I felt like there was also a kind of intersection of gender norms that I found really troubling in the ways that, you know, the boy was given a lot of extra training and extra opportunities while, the girl, while his sister was not. Um, so I'll continue to follow these kids going forward, but but that's kind of an interesting thread that I saw there too. Th thanks, especially yeah. for, for going back and, and looking at sort of the, the conceptual roots of, of, of yeah, this, yeah. this form of utopianism, I guess. Uh, one aspect, uh, when, when we got ours, it's in a closet somewhere. Uh, <laughs> it, yeah, we, we got our one of the two. Uh, it, it doesn't charge anymore. Uh, it really hit me as this this was very much device oriented and, and it seemed very strange coming being associated with Papert who who with with logo and Lego logo and and the the connection with Alan Kay and Adele Goldberg at Stanford in the development of small talk where where the yes they were very much tool oriented but it was a software creative tool mm -hmm. versus versus a thing that that carries carries what carries what curriculum, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 the, yeah. well, it, it did have a disjoint. It seemed like yeah, a very, whole software suite. it seemed very MIT. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and certainly kind of Negroponte's digital utopianism was a pretty strong influence on the project too, although in a more kind of nebulous way. I mean, it was, it was constructed around the like one computer per child that Papert had been talking about, but it was a very particular computer. Um, and you know that was in part to to address some of the early critiques of you know refurbished computer movements and other things that said, well, this computer still isn't rugged. It's still not low power. Um, this this laptop is rugged. It is low power. It is kind of specialized. Everyone's going to get the same one. They're not going to kind of get a piecemeal, you know, whatever recycled computer there is. It's their own dedicated laptop. So so yeah, it is a, a diversion from some of the other projects. Um, in that way, but um, but it had its own kind of logic behind it too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Go ahead. Well, thank you for the presentation. So, um, one thing that that this presentation kind of brings out is uh, this obsession with the silver bullets that the tech industry, as well as Silicon Valley, has. Like. We'll just yep. use the technology to solve all problems, and and you know it's very much alive, you know, in terms of general purpose AI. The people, way two people talk about it, or even um, there's this experiment going on with um, in Oakland that Y Combinator, the tech startup uh, group, is doing, which uh, ba with a minimum uh, guaranteed income. Mm -hmm. Right. So how my my question is, how has the tech community responded to the quote unquote failure of OLPC. Have we learned anything hmm. from it? Because we, you know, there hasn't been any write up. Some, somehow around 2013, 2012, it kind of just fell off a cliff where one day every newspaper would have an article about OLPC and then nothing. So nothing, yeah. have we learned anything? And, and if not, why not? Yeah, so the, the development um, community in particular followed this project very closely with great trepidation because they thought it's going to fail and when it does it's going to take us all down with it. Um, and um, you know it did fail and it did I think I, it's you know it's hard to disentangle like the 2009 um, crash and all of that there's a lot of debate about you know why development funds have lulled in various ways but um, 
But in many ways, the development community did learn a, lum a number of lessons about this in certain ways. So certainly there's still a kind of focus on individualism. There's still a focus on kind of solutionism in a problematic way. But there is a lot of discussion about you know, the legacy of OLPC within kind of international development. Um, so I think there are at least some lessons learned. In education, I would say there aren't as many lessons learned. And there's still a lot of kind of idealism and utopianism around reforming education that we see spin out through charter school movements and other alt schooling movements, kind of opt in private schools, tech heavy private schools, um, that in many ways are kind of eviscerating the legacy of public education within the US. And it's not to say that public education is perfect. I think there's a lot that can be reformed there. But, um, but whether it's a question of reform or gutting, I think is a really important one that, um, that has not really been addressed. And you know, there's often these tech fixes that are, that are proposed in education, um, as I think some of you know, Anne and others are, are focusing on in their own work, um, grad students here. Um, within Silicon Valley more broadly, I think there too not many of these lessons have been learned. Um, you know, there, within the last year, though, there has been a shift in discourse around kind of responsibility and ethics within the tech industry that I find very interesting, and I'm really interested to see where it goes forward. I think there's also an opportunity with data science programs like the one here to, to kind of change the discourse and to change the, the assumptions behind the field um, because it's a new field. It doesn't have to just adopt all of the norms from computer science. Um, that said, whether, whether this will happen and how to encourage this to happen is a big question. It's certainly something that drives my own research, but, but it's, a, it's a challenge. Thanks, Morgan, a great talk, very interesting and tremendous work. Um, again, mine is also a little bit about the, the effects of it and particularly looking um, at, at Negroponte, um, because beginning this world with, um, you know, influenced by Papert, claiming the sort of constructivist both, ends up now with, you know, this horrifying YouTube thing about learning being s achieved by injecting nanobots into the veins of students, which, I mean, is, is, is you know, again, probably more fantasy than this, but it's an enormous shift in the idea now of what how tech can affect learning. It's now not a conscious play, it's now a subconscious injection. And, and I don't know whether that's just Negroponte or, or might be a fallout from this in some way. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I haven't heard it that much beyond Negroponte, but certainly the tech solutionism, the let's even fix the problems within tech with more tech is, is something that, um, that's still very much pervasive and um, we love a quick fix, right? We love we love those stories of of miraculous transformation, as unrealistic as they are, and I think they all fit into that. There's a there's a growing trend in STEM outreach, for especially for K through six, to think about identity formation rather than about content delivery, and I'm wondering in the same way that that they were past the gender issues in using baby dolls for little girls or Fisher Price kitchens and auto garages for little boys, that there's a sense in which a positive function we could see for this is that toy function of saying that you're now telling kids at that age that, oh yeah, you can grow up to be the kind of a person who handles computers rather than the kind of person who handles pickaxes and and shovels. Yeah. That, that, and that, that, that there's, a, there's a positive aspect of identity formation around telling large numbers of small kids in a public school somewhere that, hey, you too can grow up to be someone who carries a laptop. Mm -hmm. Now, you could do that with something that costs a lot less than $100. You could do that with an actual toy, the same way you, you do with baby dolls or with Fisher Price auto garage, plastic auto garage, auto repair garages. Mm -hmm. um, so could, it, could we see that as sort of like a slightly unintended positive outcome of giving kids a not very good 
computer, but a pretty nice toy that they can get into the habit of thinking of themselves as someone who that's a possible path for me growing up. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there are a few different pieces there I, I want to, um, to address. I think I would push back a little bit that, um, on the statement that we're beyond kind of gender issues around different toys. Um, I think some stores have, have started marketing, you know, not just toy, a, boy girl, a boy aisle and a girl aisle. They've started mixing things. But I think toys still definitely are marketed in, in a very gender binary kind of way. And um, there are a few exceptions to that, but, I, but I'd say that's still a, a kind of uphill battle to fight. And there's a long legacy of um, kind of, you know, computer culture and video game culture that, that we need to push against that, that are still informing this. So m some of the current work I'm doing is within the Minecraft community, and this is often talked about as a you know, very gender egalitarian space. Both boys and girls play Minecraft, both boys and girls you know, enjoy it and all of that. And what I'm finding is that m many more boys are playing Minecraft across most servers. Most of the kind of broader Minecraft ecology of YouTube videos and Twitch channels and all of this um, is like almost entirely boys, and and this has real implications for who is scaffolding that play into learning to program, right? So um, so I would say that there is still definitely some work to be done in that space, and it, it, this work is still kind of early and it's ongoing, but um, but I think there's still some more there, and I think um, the broader thing about kind of the identity formation, I think this this is a very promising direction, and I hope that it can kind of foment some change. That said, um, you know, when I learned Logo in the 1980s, there was a similar kind of discourse of like, now you all have this tool. And certainly not all of us were able to kind of take that tool on to, um, to more, more programming uses, in part because of some of the broader cultural meanings of, of what, what computer programming is and who belongs there that were being propagated at the time through you know, movies and, and video game advertising and, and all sorts of other channels. And so it's going to be a lot of work to kind of push back on all of these, but it's certainly something I feel very passionate about working on. Um, I think that there is a lot of value there. Um, and I hope that we can continue to make some progress there. Yes. Does anybody else have I talk more now or not? So if there's somebody else who has a burning question, yeah. Oh, my only question is this was gonna be a non profit. Who made these machines and did anybody ever make a profit out of making them? Um so Qantas Computer in, um, in Taiwan made the machines. They made incredibly little profit around it. In fact, they, put a, they invested a ton in making, you know, outfitting a whole factory for this, anticipating making hundreds of thousands, and they did not. So I think in all, they lost money on it. Um, I don't know if we want to still jump in a bit with, with Deirdre. We still that was a, a, a briefer one. Um, I was hoping you could just pick up a little bit more on the kind of imagined user that you were talking about, and that they were the the way in which the the choice of design and software, et cetera, was so framed by their nostalgia, and the way in which you thought that would play forward, potentially gender, et cetera. You talked about it a little bit, but if you could mm -hmm. talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Um, and it's certainly a thread that's that's pretty strong throughout the book. It's always hard to pack a lot into, you know, just an hour or even an hour and a half with some questions. But um, you know, the the orientation of play around a particular kind of technical play, I think, is is kind of the crux here, where they frame, you know, oh, the natural playfulness and creative creativity of children will of course find use within this particular software. Will find an outlet through programming you know, programming video games in particular, but maybe programming in other ways, um, is the kind of, the ideological slippage there. So there, there's a slippage between a general concept of play and a particular kind of technical play that I found pretty problematic. I'm happy to, to chat more about it too. But. Please join me in thanking Morgan for a wonderful talk. Yes. Thank you all too.